Welcome everyone um, to the Climate Action Webinar Series, Design for Change uh, with AIA California. Thank you for joining us for the fifth chapter of our AIA California Climate Action Webinar Series. I'm Rona Rothenberg, the Vice President of Government Relations for AIA California, and I'm pleased to host this webinar with our speaker. Uh, in the event that you've missed the other webinars in the series, be sure to check out the Climate Action uh, pull down in AIA California's website for recording slide decks and additional helpful resources. A brief introduction. As you know, the Climate Action webinar series is centered around each of the pillars of the AIA's national framework for design excellence. Design is about aesthetic components and also how buildings perform for people. The framework for design excellence is made up of 10 measures, formerly known as the COAT Top 10. It organizes our thinking, facilitates conversations with our clients and communities we serve, public and private, and sets meaningful goals and targets for climate action, which are our mission uh, in our work. Today's webinar focuses on designing for change and with this lens, looking at your uh, work and the work for your various clients, we, we will highlight flexibility, future adaptability, risk assessment, resilience, passive survivability. A little bit of housekeeping. Uh, please use the Q&A box rather than the chat in, the, in your scroll bar as you wave your cursor over the bar, it will pop up in the Zoom window. Feel free to type questions for Wade, and then we'll cover those in the last 15 or so minutes or when he's completed his presentation. You can also raise your hand in the participant screen and we'll call on you. We will try to be methodical and uh, any questions that we don't get to by our closing uh, adjournment, we will include when we, um, when we post the recording. So I'm honored and pleased to introduce a colleague, Wade, Kellifer FAIA, a partner of KFA Architecture, founding partner, founded his firm in 1975. Wade is a native San Franciscan who grew up in Washington, D.C. He received his BA in English from Stanford, worked as a union farmer, and, re and realized after a year, a framer, excuse me, that writing and carpentry come together in architecture. He's a graduate of UCLA School of Architecture and Urban planning, uh, where he met Barbara Flam Flamang, FAIA. They married in 1977, and they're proud parents of two adult children. In 2006, he was elected to the College of Fellows of the AIA, and in 2016, his firm uh, was named Firm of the Year by AIA California. Wade is the current Vice President, President-elect of AIA Los Angeles, one of the largest components in the country. I'm pleased to introduce my fellow architect, Wade Killifer, FAIA. Wade, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello, AIA. I've always wanted to do that. Uh, good afternoon. Today I'm going to talk about our firm's initial work in adaptive reuse design, discuss the sustainable benefits of reusing old buildings, discuss the benefits for the city and for the developer, go through the preliminary steps in the design process, and finally show case studies of buildings that we have worked on. I think that most architects have done some remodeling of existing buildings in their careers and are aware of both the benefits and the drawbacks of that kind of work. In short, there's less work to do on a rehab project because a lot of the building is already there. The important decisions have already been made, but often the work is harder because of difficult existing conditions and necessary code upgrades. Our first significant historic building was the Clark House, a 1912 YMCA building that we con converted to an affordable single room occupancy hotel in 1990. We were a young firm 30 years ago with a single family house portfolio and the learning curve was almost vertical for us. New sh concrete shear walls were were required along the inside of all the exterior perimeter walls and throughout the interior of the structure to the underside of the concrete roof. 
to accommodate these new shear walls, all existing wood trim, wood wainscots, portions of wood floors, and marble wainscots were removed and carefully numbered and reinstalled upon completion of the structural work. Wives of brick were then removed from the exterior walls and replaced by concrete shear walls. The shotcrete was plastered to match the original plaster finishes and the various finished materials were reinstalled. A decade later, we bumped up against Tom Gilmore, who was just starting work on the old bank district. He was really fun to work with, although his budget did not always catch up with his ambitions. We got along well, and he hired us to do the architecture for three buildings, the, the San Fernando, the Hellman, and the Continental as the first projects to take advantage of the brand new adaptive reuse ordinance for Los Angeles. The adoption of the adaptive reuse ordinance in June two, of 2000 made it economically feasible to convert scores of abandoned or underutilized buildings in the city's historic core from their prior use as office buildings to residential lofts or apartments. The intent of this ordinance crafted by the planning department, the Department of Building and Safety and the fire department is to preserve the downtown, preserve downtown's architectural and cultural past and encourage the development of a residential community in the city's primary employment center. The key provisions of the ordinance are, one, to waive planning department review, two, exempt the upper floors from disabled access code provisions, three, reduce seismic strengthening requirements, four, apply the provisions of the 1992 mechanical code rather than the more restrictive current code. These reductions in requirements brought the cost of converting these historic monuments down by about a third. Everyone assumed Tom Gilmore would fail, and when the old bank district was a spectacular success, the development community collectively figured that if Tom could make old buildings into trendy lofts, anyone could. We were suddenly very busy and got curious about how many buildings there were in the historic core. On a Sunday morning, we headed out with a team of architects and engineers and walked the historic core and identified about 40 buildings that would be good candidates for conversion. Seven years later, we walked the core again and found that almost half the buildings had been converted. To date, uh, we've completed 33 adaptive reuse conversions in downtown LA. All right, let's talk about the sustainability benefits of adaptive reuse. Scientists say that we have a decade to get climate change under control. Renovation and reuse projects typically save between 50 and 75% of the embodied carbon emissions compared to constructing a new building. The greenhouse gases that are emitted to construct our buildings in the first place is called embodied carbon. Embodied ed energy is about the way a building is built rather than how it is used. It concerns the upstream value of energy consumed by the processes associated with building production from mining, and the processing of natural resources straight into manufacturing and transportation. Embodied energy is the front end component of the life cycle impact of a building. That's the part that never can be changed. So by reusing existing buildings, we make use of the embodied energy already expended instead of using new energy to demolish and build anew. A report produced by the Preservation Green Lab of the National Trust for Historic Preservation titled The Greenest Building, finds that a new building will take 10 to 80 years to overcome the negative climate change caused by the construction, by construction as compared to reusing an existing building. I have poached several of their slides. Building structure and substructure represent about 55% of a commercial building's embodied carbon footprint and building enclosure and construction and building in Closure and construction represent about 33%. About 11% of all global CO2 emissions are caused by cement production. The iron and steel sector amount to about 10% of global CO2 emissions. And more than 5% of the world's electrical generation is spent on the production of aluminum. In addition to the sustainability benefits, there are also benefits to the city and to the development team and working with existing building stock. 
For the city, adaptive reuse helps with the job housing balance. It places housing next to transportation it re and it reuses and celebrates historic resources. For the design team, adaptive reuse also avoids a lot of the usual barriers to development. The buildings are already entitled. There's no entitlement process. There's no FAR requirements. There are no maximum unit count requirements. There are no parking requirements. There are no open space requirements. There's no planning review except, of course, historic. And there are no NIMBYs to get in your way. The approval process is quicker, so the construction can start sooner. In a best case, but not unreasonable schedule, a demolition permit could be approved six months after project initiation. And the construction could be completed in a year after that. And the rehabilitation of a beautiful, elegant, 12-story historical building should cost about the same as new construction of a five over two wood and concrete structure. Here are the first steps to getting a project started. Step one is getting an accurate measured laser survey of the building in plan section and elevation. Step two, if the building is historic, is getting a report from a historical consultant identifying the remaining historic fabric. This provides a roadmap for the design showing what must remain and what can be changed. Step three is to get a structural engineer to build a computer model of the building using strength values taken from push and shear testing by testing labs. Historic buildings were not designed specifically to resist earthquake forces, but they were built with a good deal of inherent resistive mass. Usually the ground floor requires a significant lateral strengthening. Upper floors typically require some new, new shear walls, decreasing in dimension each level up. Step four is to provide a lateral design, excuse me, step four is to provide a, lateral, a design layout that gets the maximum number of the appropriate sized units in a building. Small units typically rent for less and therefore rent up faster, Larger units cost less per square foot to build. What's the right mix for each location? What fits best in each building? Beyond the determination of unit mix, each building has its own character and it is important to understand that, that character and understand that character and bring it forward in the design. Does the building have white marble halls and wainscots? Perhaps the units should have a bright luminescent quality. Is there dark mahogany? in the paneling and trim, how do we bring that sense of order into a modern open loft? Step five is to engage the fire department to weigh in on smoke evacuation systems, particularly in exit corridors and stairways. Since these buildings were built, were not built to current code, an extended dance needs to occur between the building officials and the architect. Long dead end corridors abound, no elevators have required vestibules, stairways are not enclosed, are not ventilated, and sometimes do not lead directly to the public way. Exit corridors do not have adequate fire rating. Each of these issues is negotiated until the building is satisfied, building official is satisfied that reasonable accommodation has been made and that the tenants will be safe and will be able to exit the building safely in an emergency. Step six is to get the budget nailed down. Since cost is such a critical factor in the eventual su success of these adaptive reuse projects, it's important to have a general contractor on the project team from the early conceptual stages of the design. Depending on lender requirements, when the contractor is on, brought on early, demolition can begin as soon as the approval process is received from the park service usually four to six months from the starting of the design process, preceding the actual building permit by several months. Now I'm gonna show, briefly show you seven case studies of successful adaptive reuse projects. Um, this is one of the great buildings in Los Angeles. The, the Eastern Columbia Outfitting Company's Art Deco Retail Tower epitomized the height of opulence when it opened in 1930 and has since become a zigzag modern landmark in downtown Los Angeles. 
we rehab it from a long abandoned clothing warehouse into 147 condominiums between 880 square feet and 3,200 square feet with a rooftop terrace under the famous Eastern Columbia Clock Tower that has a fitness center, pool, spa, sun deck, and outdoor fireplace and spectacular views of the city. As the building was designed as a department store with deep and, a, a deep uh, and square floor plate, it didn't really lay out well for residential uses, requiring natural light. After many iterations, we were able to find a typical floor plate solution that worked well with the long deep units that the building's dimensions required. By adding long corridors from the main exit passages, it was possible to enter the units at the middle closer to the windows, placing the bathrooms and closets to the rear. The developer was able to acquire the parcels to the north and to the west, and this allowed for the addition of new windows with balconies on two facades, which had covered the now demolished buildings. The new Pershing Apartments is an adaptive reuse of a three-story SRO hotel at the southeast corner of Fifth and Main. The building, originally known as the Charnock Block, was constructed in 1889 as medical offices and was later occupied by various drugstores. It is distinguished by the building's original facade, which includes an extravagant Second Empire, which includes extravagant Second Empire bay windows that project from the upper story. New construction also included combining the Pershing with the adjacent building to the south, known as the Roma Hotel. In 1988, it was converted to an SRO hotel by Skid Row Housing Trust in one of the city's first attempts to preserve its available housing. The rooms were small, poorly lit, with community bathrooms down the hall and a central communal kitchen. The new construction provides 69 units set around a landscape cart courtyard, each which is with its own bathroom and kitchenette. The cardinal rule for historic rehabilitation was broken when the contractor essentially hollowed out the center core of the building, making construction easier for them, leaving the facade alone buttressed by steel I-beams. This is called a facadectomy and is very much frowned upon by the, uh, by the historical community. Communal garden plots cover the roof and there are very, and there are competitions among the residents for the most uh, productive vegetable plots. After sitting vacant for over 20 years, the historic Linda Vista Hospital in Los Angeles' Boyle Heights neighborhood was redeveloped into 120 affordable senior units by Amcal Multi-Housing. The prom prominent Spanish mission-style hospital campus was built in the 20s and 30s, originally serving the employees of the Santa Fe Railroad and subsequently becoming a community hospital. After purported negligence led to a series of deaths in the early 90s, the hospital was closed. The vacant structure, full of old hospital atmosphere and character, was subsequently used for the filming of hundreds of movies and TV programs, including some several reality ghost pro, uh, programs. Reports of unexplained phenomena came from overnight security and production crews. Three spirits in, protector, in particular have been cited on multiple occasions. A little girl lurks in the surgical room. A young woman paces the hallways of the third floor. And the spirit of an orderly still makes his daily rounds. Still makes his daily rounds. The Hollenbeck Terrace Apartments now has studio, one bedroom, and two bedroom apartments for low income seniors. The renovation meshes with the original fabric of the Spanish mission style uh, hospital campus. The landscape setting, the exterior details, massing, historical lobbies, and common areas remain. The patient rooms, the nurses' dormitory offices, and laboratory areas have been converted to living units. Amenities include elegantly decorated community rooms, com computer room, historic grand dining room, game room, library, gallery, and performance space, barbecue area, gardens, rooftop lounge, social programs, and social program, social service program space. 
A primary goal for the project was to preserve the building's essential historical character while bringing back to life with an efficient new use. Some of the greatest challenges associated with this redesign and redevelopment were the removal of the remaining hospital systems and unneeded infrastructure from the building, as well as waste left behind from the numerous movie and TV and video shoots. Historic with windows providing adequate light, patient medical treatment areas and other back house hospital uses such as the boiler room and morgue were particularly challenging to reuse because they were not designed to be pleasant and habitable spaces. This refurbishment is most apparent at the original entry of the building. Now the residential lobby, which features yellow travertine floors and mahogany paneling enjoyed by residents and visitors alike. Holland by Terrace is a LEED Gold certified project. We've converted three historic buildings into high-end hotels in the downtown with the Seidel Group, the Ace, the Freehand, and the Nomad. Here is the Nomad. Founded in, in 1904 by Amadeo Giannini, the Bank of Italy provided financial services to pr a previously underserved demographic of small depositors In 23, the Bank of Italy opened its doors in Los Angeles to the public at 650 South Spring Street. But by the 1990s, the former Bank, had, uh, bank of Italy headquarters slipped into disrepair like many of the other historic buildings along the 7th Street corridor. The lobby, the basement, and the upper floors had been largely gutted over the years, leaving behind a hulking shell of a bygone era. Broken windows patched with plywood and graffiti were the only signs of recent activity. The Seidel Group had deep expertise and experience in converting historic structures into new boutique hotels and acquired the property in 2014. The building's historic exterior remained remarkably intact despite many changes to the interior over the years. Original architectural features adorning the street facing elevations were retained, repaired, and cleaned as needed. The ground floor, which once housed, which once housed the main banking hall, executive offices, and credit departments, was converted to a hotel front desk and main lobby area and serves as the living room with the restaurant, seating areas, library, and bar. Prior to its acquisition in 2014, the building's second through 12th floors were stripped to the, to, to the structural subsystem. These upper levels were rehabbed into guest room floors with wood paneled wainscoting, crown molds, hardwood and carpeted floors with finished ceilings. The primary vault was converted into a public restroom vestibule to ensure that its fully restored 50 ton circular bronze door would be showcased. The completion of the Nomad returns the former bank building back to the public, its doors open to the community. Guests and locals alike can enjoy a slice of the LA's historic past from the Nomad's mezzanine bar level and restaurant, which overlook the former banking hall library uh, lobby. The roof, now functional and accessible to the public, has a rooftop bar and pool from which you can take in the panoramic views of downtown Los Angeles' historic past and present. Soho Warehouse, a private members only club located in downtown LA Arts District on Santa Fe Avenue near 7th Street, was originally built in 1916 to house plumbing supply and paper straw manufacturing companies. The 80,000 square foot and seven stories plus a basement, this adaptive reuse project underwent a seismic upgrade and has 48 guest rooms, a two-story gym with a steam and sauna rooms, an outdoor garden, three restaurants, three bars, lounges, event spaces, and a rooftop pool. It is Soho House's largest West Coast facility. 
the overall building approach, the overall building de design approach was to maintain much of the original character as possible. The interior design is a mix of the building's history, juxtaposing art deco elements and industrial exposed building elements from the original construction in 1916 with 1970s style furniture inspired by the property's period as a music recording space. The Mediterranean inspired restaurant is located in the former ground floor loading dock. A portion of the space has been converted into a garden with plants outside. The rooftop deck includes an indoor bar, a small pool overlooking a view of the industrial district and the downtown skyline. In a much different type of project, we designed the new MGA entertainment mixed use campus on their 24 acre site in Chatsworth. The new MGA headquarters building, the one in the center, is a former LA Times printing facility surrounded by four phases containing of 660 units, 30,000 square feet of retail and parking. The printing plant was designed to withstand a nuclear attack and had four foot thick concrete roof, had a four foot thick concrete roof. We talk about embodied carbon. It lay dormant for 10 years before the launch of its transformation into a new corporate residential and retail campus for the MGA and for MGA Entertainment, the maker of the iconic Bratz dolls. They make a lot of money off of these guys. The MGA corporate headquarters, which houses production, light industrial and creative office space, and a daycare learning center for the MGA employees and residents. It's organized, um, it's organized by its circulation space that moves down into the center of, of the old printing place. Large sweeping graphic fins added to the facade provide employees and residents with a striking greeting at the entry plaza. Anchoring the plaza is a stepped amphitheater which climbs up the parking garage and breaks into terraced landscape plateaus, connecting the plaza with the mountain view mountain view amenities on the garage roof, a clubhouse, pool, sports courts, and the community gardens park. The headquarters building was designed to bring together corporate creative development and production teams in an open, collaborative, and communal space. It will be surrounded by those four mixed-use buildings containing the residential units. Two of the mixed use buildings have already been uh, are in construction and one of them will, is nearing completion in 2020. The amenities include a village green, transit plaza, dog park, community gardens, two pool plazas, and a sports park. Woven through the perimeter of the project is a trail that is both a promenade and an exercise path landscaped with canopy trees, native shrubs, and drought tolerant grasses, which connect the campus to the surrounding natural landscapes. This is uh, a map of the West LA Veterans Administration. Uh, you can see, so you can see my cursor, Wilshire Boulevard's down here, the 405 is along here. Um, the West LA Veterans Administration, it sits on land donated to the federal government in 1887, near the intersection of 405 Freeway and Wilshire Boulevard. In 2011, a group of homeless vets sued the center, claiming that the VA was renting land for commercial gain and ignoring the needs of the homeless veterans producing the housing. In 2016, the Department of Veterans Affairs announced a plan to add 1,600 units of housing for homeless vets to the hospital campus. We were on the team selected to, math, to master plan the development and to build or rehab the housing units on the campus north of Wilshire. This is a great site. The LA purple line down here um, 
The LA uh, Metro Purple Line is being extended from Koreatown's Wilshire Western Station to Westwood VA Hospital Station as part of the Purple Line extension. The existing site is beautiful with tall oak and eucalyptus trees, but it doesn't have much of a sense of order. It was built over time. Our goal for the master plan was to give the North Campus a sense of order and purpose by knitting the existing historic nodes together in one perceptual perceptible axial design. We connected the Metro Transit Plaza to the chapel and then to the Wadsworth Theater, which is connected to the Civic Center, through the Town Center to the Clock Tower and then up to the Wellness Center. Provides a coherent pedestrian path up through the campus. Each axis leads to another and another. The North Campus, up here um, the quite an introspective north village follows the original fan pattern of the original streets with large open spaces quads promenades and pedestrian streets and walks most of the buildings in, at the north village are historic renovations the south village has centralized services spaces a retail feel at the town center a large open central area and campus-wide gathering areas with podium courtyard buildings and much higher density. The majority of the buildings are new construction. The campus services supporting the residential community will be dispersed all over the entire site. Building 207 was the first building that we got to work on and it, uh, construction should start later this year. You can see um, the central we, we maintain the exterior of the building and the central hallway um, as an odd to the historical fabric. Um, build the, um, let's see, the building 207 came with a typical conundrum. The main entry was up a historical significant set of stairs in full violation of disabled access requirements. We needed to provide uh, access at the ground level to the building and tried a number of solutions, but finally ended up leaving the stairs there and tucking a new entry uh, underneath them. We were also tasked with coming up with design guidelines for all the new construction. The VA's preservation priorities include the adaptive reuse of historic buildings. Alterations should have rehabilitation as its primary goal and should conform to the Secretary of Interior's standards. New construction should be sympathetic to the historical district, which is generally in the mission revival style. Basic tenets for new construction follows. For the site, avoid disrupting important spatial relationships, landscapes, roadways, and view sets. For height, stay within or under adjacent building heights. Try to match story heights. Form, stay with massing, massing thresholds of existing buildings. Match rectilinear footprints. Break very large masses into smaller elements. Buildings should be symmetrical and orthogonal. Openings, keep door and window size, form and cadence, regimented and uniform. Consider arched windows and accent windows. Roofing. Use, refer to existing roofing types, hip on flat, gable on hip and flat. Use terracotta tiles. Cladding, exteriors should be smooth stucco. New construction should be distinct from the original buildings. Building colors should be in the same value and hue as the original structures. This last project is LA County General Hospital. The original hospital located at 1200 State Street opened in 1933. Its Art Deco construction earned its nickname, the Great Stone Mother, and had 800 beds. The 1994 Northridge earthquake on January 17, 1994, took the building out of compliance of earthquake and fire safety codes. While it no longer meets the California hospital seismic safety law, it does meet current seismic standards for non-hospital use. There's a wellness center on the first floor and includes offices for nonprofit organizations, a community outreach, 
and classes for wellness activities, a dance studio, and a small YMCA. We were asked to take a look at the building by the Department of Health Services as a housing facility. The old General Hospital was formally determined eligible for listing in the National Register of Historic Places in 1994. Let's see, the, uh, the architect you can see in the upper right, his name was Carl Muck. He was a very serious guy, as you can see. Um, let's see, the, the character defining features of the hospital are generally grouped into three categories. The overall visual character, the exterior materials and craftsmanship, the interior spaces, features, and finish. We place community service, service serving uses on the first floor, including a grocery store, a fitness center, and a kitchen and event space. And we put administrative uses on the second floor with counseling offices, a clinic, and property management. On the third through 17th floors, we stacked units taking care to preserve the historic corridors. The units were sized according to the existing window base, but as you can see, they are very livable. We ended up with 726 units that can house 1,265 formerly homeless folks. We then asked Nabi Yusuf's structural engineering office to take a look at the structural system. Not having structural drawings, they surmised that the roof and floors had one-way one concrete slabs supported by concrete encased steel beams, and that reinforced concrete walls around the perimeter provided primary lateral resistance. The proposed structural re retrofit provides new reinforced concrete walls shown here in red, uh, 14 inch thick for the transverse walls and 10 inch thick for the longitudinal walls from the foundations to the roof supported on new mat foundations. We asked Morley instruction to look at what this would all cost and they provided a detailed qualified cost estimate that the retrofit, would, retrofit construction would cost 263 million bucks. The California Housing Partnership Coalition put together a, a chart of sources and uses for the full project showing funds from capital contributions from the sale of tax credits, tax exempt bonds and county gap financing. They provided a full uh, reuse budget, including Morley's construction costs uh, with, co with soft and financing for a project cost of 383 million. This works out to about $300,000 a bed, which compares very favorably to the $500,000 plus cost per bed, which seems to be the going rate these days. We presented this study to Supervisor Solis in March of 2018, and she was very interested, but I have since learned that they are going to consider it later this fall, two and a half years after we presented it. So you can see that these projects come in all shapes and sizes, former and current uses. The buildings can be clad in timeless terracotta, have classic neon signage, or have four inch thick concrete roof structures. What's important is that we recognize and take advantage of their capacity to reinvent themselves, to not require the use of new energy and resources in order to provide places for people to live and work and flourish in this great city. Thank you. Thank you, Wade, for that excellent, diverse, um, and impressive uh, portfolio of examples of, of uh, various reuses that are going to be resilient and um, sustainable. So we have a few questions. I've made some notes, so I'm going to uh, read from my notes, and then I'll leave it to Wade to respond. Mr. Nathaniel Wilson asks, for single-family residential sites, the City of Santa Monica ADU ordinance allows for the conversion of existing garages into renovated and rent renovations into new ADUs. These small projects seem to be important adaptive reuse. Your thoughts? 
Very much so. I mean, they just like uh, the, with those historic buildings, we're making use of unused property to uh, to house people, which is, as we all know, is our number one issue in our city. Right, and he he has another question about the conversion of parking garages. He notes that it's sort of a monument to the automobile, and there. It, you might say idiosyncratic buildings in terms of their low floor to floor heights and their sloping floors. What's your, been your experience in adaptive reuse of parking garages, assuming that the trends in automobiles will change? I haven't uh, done a, an old parking garage into, uh, into housing, but all the garages I think that most architects are doing now don't have ramps, don't have internal ramps. Uh, but that have uh, floor plates that are level so that when uh, cars go away um, or are much reduced, we can rehab these spaces into uh, either residential or other types of uses. The, the key is just not to build those interior uh, slope ramps, put speed ramps in to uh, get from floor to floor. Uh, we have a, a question, or it's really a comment from Remy Tan, who says, for the developer to make sure, you've worked with now uh, various developers and you gave us some excellent examples. Uh, uh, the, the, um, the question, they, it's really a comment, existing building has to be obtained at a good price and it has to pencil out. And then there's a note, the sales price less the, the building cost less the cost of rehab, less the cost, but plus the cost of rehab, the cost of marketing, the cost of uh, holding time and project time has to equal a profit or it's not worth the developer's time. So can you just address how you worked with the developers on the cost metric? It's a good question and I think it applies to adaptive reuse of uh, public buildings too in my experience. Yeah, most of the building, the historic buildings I showed you, um, were empty. They had uh, maybe some retail uses on the ground floor, but the upper 11 floors all were just had pigeons living in them. So they were worth nothing. Uh, so the, the cost of, to do the rehab and marketing and all that other stuff uh, is borne by the reduced cost of the existing structure. Um, and any good developer will make all of those uh, assumptions as when they put together, as they put together their um their performance but yes you're right it all has to add up uh, but what a good developer does is he creates value and um, these buildings have a lot of inherent value to start with they just have to be reused in a in a, in a good way i'll add i'll add myself do you what you know how how as the architect can we strengthen our role in convincing building owners, both private and public sector, that it's worthwhile to invest in the existing stock rather than tear it down and build new? Well, I think uh, the, all the work that uh, all the architects are doing in town to preserve old buildings and show how great they are, I think it, the, the owners of those buildings are now very proud of what they have. You know, I would think that the, that kind of spirit of of pride would leach over into the other guys and uh, they want to do it too. I, when After we did our first couple buildings, we got calls from a lot of people that said, we didn't think our building was worth anything, but now we realize we can, we can put people living in that and that's, that's why downtown has taken off. I, I would agree. Um, Summer Vaughn asks, does the historical consultant usually gather all the available photos and historical drawings and other documentation? Or does your firm do some of that research yourself? Can you talk a little uh, they, about how you work they, with the historic historic consultants or whether you have preservation architects on, on board? We don't have preservation ar architects on board, although we have people that have done dozens of those buildings that I showed you. Um, the historical consultant is absolutely critical um, because there are going to be trade-offs and it's it's up to essentially the historical consultant to guide you in a way that lets you keep what's really important but if life safety is involved maybe something that's nice but not fully important 
uh, can go. So we rely very heavily on our historical consultants and uh, they are generally fun to work with and pleasant people. So that's a, a fun part of the uh, processes when you look at an old building and say, how are we going to do this? I would agree with that. Uh, uh, Ian Merker asks about the, you, the uh, uh, um, adaptation of the surgery theater. I'm assuming, Ian, that that was a, in the VA project. Quite an interesting project. And I, I'm going to add to Ian's question. I, I was wondering about seismic resiliency since, um, well, I'm not sure you explained whether you had converted it for the Veterans Administration or whether um, uh, it, it was converted by a third party. But could you talk about the surgery? And you, met, you mentioned infrastructure that had been adapted from a hospital to the current uses. But could you talk a little bit more broadly about si both the technical um, program that got converted and the seismic aspects of that project? Well, the, the, uh, let me go back a little bit. The, the VA is being developed uh, by a consortium of uh, Thomas Saffron Associates, uh, US Vets, and Century Housing. These are really good, fun developers to work for. And they got together to go after this project to, to build 1,600 units. So they essentially um, can take make use of the land there, and uh, they are going out to normal um, funding sources for affordable housing. So the, the surgery, there is no surgery in the North Campus uh, that I know of um, at the VA, or at least it's not one of the buildings that we have looked at. There's a, there's a phasing diagram that I didn't show you, but uh, there are about five phases with maybe five or six buildings in each phase. Some of them old buildings that'll be rehabbed and some of them brand new buildings that'll be built in the same spirit of the ones that are there there. So this is a 10 year process. Um, as I said, that there are two, three buildings that have already been done by other developers. Our first building will break ground uh, later this year. And uh, then there's a whole rollout of three or four buildings per year until we get everything all done. Right. Um, I answer that? Yes, you did. And Henry Siegel asks about how do you measure and track embody, embodied carbon um, and use that to show savings compared to uh, new structures and make material choices for the project? That's above my pay grade. I, <laughs> I would... Uh, that's I fair. I, I, I that, that's know fair, how, but it's a good question. I, I would, yeah, I wouldn't know how to to uh, to make that determination, but there are plenty of people that, that that are working very hard on that right now. We have a lot of questions coming in here. Brian Senior asks: Clearly, adaptive reuse over time can and will have an impact on climate change. So, two questions: To what extent do your clients base their selection of team and design decisions on climate action? And what are some of the most difficult to integrate sustainable strategies in the projects? Um, let's see. The, what's the first one again? To what extent do your clients base their selection of team and design decisions on climate action? I, I uh, there are different, you know, for every developer, there's a different ethos. And uh, some of them care about uh, climate change and some of them it never comes up. So we have to sort of, uh, sneak it in on them. We're, we, we tell them that we're not going to put anything in their building that uses carbon and then we wait for a minute and see if they nod or shake their head. Um, what's the second question? What are some of the most difficult to integrate sustainable strategies on some of the projects you showed? It just goes building by building. Um, is that usually the, the difficult part is, is exiting and fire safety versus historical um, fabric. You know, there, there are no elevator vestibules. They're, the hallways do not go to the right places. They're dead-ended. Uh, those issues are always the hardest ones to solve. Thank you. Gabrielle Alaka asks, how have you dealt with parking um, with historical building reuse? 
these old buildings sometimes have zero or very little parking. Do you end up being grandfathered in or do you have to apply for a variance? Uh, most of your projects were in Los Angeles, so it would be under the Los Angeles zoning. I, I assume yeah, there's no, uh, for, that's the thing about the adaptive reuse ordinance. It doesn't require parking other than what's already there. Now the old parking stalls in the old days, the bays are a little tighter and they don't really, they don't meet today's standards, but we're not required to put in new parking only to maintain what's, what's there. And that's, that has a lot to do with which buildings have been converted and which buildings haven't. The ones with uh, some parking and with adequate light and air are the ones that have been done. The ones that haven't been done are ones without uh, any parking or access to light and air on the property line. That's interesting. Um, Veronica Mercado has a question. The adaptive reuse of malls has garnered more attention over the last decade, as many across the nation have fallen to vacancy. Do you have any thoughts on the best approach for the reuse of large mall structures? And have you had any experience with these types of projects? I, I've, I did one scheme for a Horton Plaza in San Diego a few years ago, but I, I haven't been brought those kinds of projects. I, the, the, the issue is going to be uh, the bay depth, the distance to the windows, because mm -hmm. those, these are big square buildings like the Eastern Columbia. Um, you're going to have to cut big holes in the building, the courtyards and, and plazas to, um, to get light and air into the, in the middle of the space. That's the main issue. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Um, I'll note, I, hear, I see here in the Bay Area, some of them are just coming down which is a sad commentary. Livio Stabil, I hope I pronounced that right, comments, could you um, comment on adaptive reuse and feasibility regarding zero net energy? Have you, have you had zero net energy goals in any of these major adaptive reuse projects? Uh, no, um, most of the projects I've shown you except for the Nomad and the Soho House, um, they were all done a dozen years ago. So um, it wasn't as big an issue then. And it hasn't come up much in terms of, uh, of uh, zero net energy on, on the new buildings. It's, I think people feel pretty good about saving what they've got and they figured they, they've done their bit. But I'm sure as we move forward, uh, we're going to move into all uh, electric buildings in the future. I would, I would con concur with that. James all asked the question, there continues to be a perception on the part of developers and owners that all local governing building department officials do not make the process easy. Easy is in quotes for adaptive reuse. This keeps people on the sidelines. Can you comment on the prior and ongoing efforts of AIA Los Angeles and the LA, LADBS on, and others on making this more streamlined? Well, they, the LADBS did an amazing thing when they passed the adaptive reuse, so when they rewrote the, the ordinance in 2000. So that was a, a big thing. And I, you know, building officials are building officials. You get good ones, you get bad ones, you get guys you can't, uh, that you love, you like working with you and you, you problem solve together and then you get run into other people that are just block, brick walls. So it depends on case by case basis. I, I think building officials want to do a good job. They also want to provide a safe building. I'll also offer uh, as, as citizen architects, we can make a difference by educating our colleagues in cities and counties about the merits of some of these applications. Fannie Wu asks, these downtown tall historic buildings are often the most energy intensive buildings. So what techniques have you used to address this and decrease operational carbon? Um, there, that's not true. I, I disagree with the premise. All the heating and cooling is done with, uh, with mini splits which are as, as efficient as we can get. The water heating is, is still gas, but um, they're, they're not inefficient uh, in themselves. 
And then um, one last question about Los Angeles. Knowing how large um, LA is, do you think there are very many more buildings left in the downtown that would be uh, suitable? What, how is that evolving in Los Angeles since you have that expertise? I, I think there are a, a good 20 or 30 buildings that could be uh, could be converted. That, as I said, that the, the issues are, do they have, a lot of them were built with the windows right on the property line, which are not legal windows. So you need to solve that problem. Um, you need to get good light and air into the, into the living units. And the other thing is, as we talked, said before, is the parking. Uh, parking, everything, as we all know, starts with parking and trash, right? Mm -hmm, that's right. I, I'll, I'll, I'll close the questions with one last question from one of our um, AIA California Strategic Counselors, my colleague Brian Sennert, and then we'll, we'll close the, the, the session. Are you experiencing clients integrating advanced energy efficiency, renewable or advanced technology for um, uh, building systems? It's yes. There are there there are a half a dozen developers that are way out in front of us and have, have come to us with a full program that they want to employ. And then, and then there are other guys that just don't want to take the trouble. So it's just on a case by case basis. There are heroes and there are goats, as we all know. I think that's that's so true. Thank you for a really excellent uh, presentation. Very informative and. Uh, so just to close for the, the um, 125 people who joined us, thank you all very much. Uh, uh, the health and safety AIA credit should appear in your transcript. We'll be sending out Wade's slide deck and additional recommended resources tomorrow. A copy of the recording will be made available as, all, as always. More resources and tools are on the pull down, www.aiacalifornia.org slash climate hyphen action. Uh, we, I, I wanted to also acknowledge my colleague, De Deborah Jared, FAIA, the president of AIA California. She's been with us today. Uh, thank you, Deborah, for your leadership and uh, uh, in the climate action in initiatives and all of our other work. Please do join us on Wednesday, June 24th at noon for the next panel discussion focused on designing for equitable communities. And if you, any of you would like to be involved with the climate action initiatives of AIA California, please do contact us through the webpage and we'll be sure to engage your expertise. And um, anything else from you, Wade? before well, we, we close up. I'm good. Thank you very much for really work that's a credit to all of us and visitors and the citizens of Los Angeles and um, uh, uh, pleased to have hosted this informative uh, seminar. Thank you, Rona and Wade. Thank you.